So that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting question. It follows and tracks along the lines of a medical illness, the relationship of memory loss to surgery. And we certainly know, you know, we began to discover this actually in the 1980s. Uh, Guy McCann, who was at Johns Hopkins uh, at the time, began noticing that people who uh, underwent cardiac bypass were uh, likely to develop memory problems afterwards. And so it was all about the bypass pump and putting them on that pump. Well, at that time, a cardiac bypass, uh, the average duration of surgery was 8 to 12 hours. It was an all day, so you were in there all day. It became clear when we began studying this uh, in greater detail that it wasn't had nothing to do with the bypass. It had to do with the length of time that one was under anesthesia and the depth of the anesthesia that they were under. And so uh, this is important. There's also an accumulative effect we know, uh, and we've learned over time that the more surgeries you've had, with the more anesthesia will add up. Each of these, a tiny additional insult to the brain. And so as we get older, we really do have a challenge on our hands when we potentially need a surgery. And that challenge is, my golly, I'm a little bit afraid of the anesthesia that I'm going to get. And, but on the other hand, right, so uh, my typical example will be somebody who needs a knee replacement or a hip replacement, and they can't walk, and they're in agony all day long, and they say, well, I'm just going to live like this and suffer because I do not want to take the risk of that anesthesia. And then I always say, well, being sedentary all day long and not exercising and moving about is a bigger risk factor for dementia than the anesthesia is, <laughs> number one. So you might want to get that knee and hip fixed. The, the, the second is, uh, have you ever tried to think clearly when you're in severe pain? You cannot think clearly when you're in severe pain. So over the long run, we balance that. Now, if somebody came in and said, I am just so upset with these wrinkles, right, that I got all over my face. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, for an eight-hour facial sculpting remake so I can look like a teenager again. I, I would probably advise don't do it, you know, that's, uh, having a pretty face does not protect you from dementia. I can guarantee that. Uh, uh, so, so, we do need to, so we do need to think about those things. Elective surgeries out. And the other thing that we do is, and, and this is also for our loved ones that have memory and thinking problems, is we don't avoid. So I have a young lady who went in just today uh, for a, or maybe it was yesterday, or I think it was today, went in for a cystoscopy, which is a mild procedure to examine the bladder because she's had a lot of blood in her urine and there's concerns about a bladder cancer or something of that nature. Uh, and bladder cancer typically is a very treatable form of cancer, uh, uh, non-invasively. And her husband, who's her caregiver, was just petrified of, oh my God, they're gonna give her anesthesia. And I said, well, what you need to do is you need to talk with the urologist and the anesthesiologist. You need to tell them I have concerns about memory in this person. And then what they'll do is they'll go lighter with the anesthesia or pick alternatives. So one of the ways uh, to do this is with a light anesthesia, like you get with your colonoscopy, they don't put the mask on you or intubate you or knock you out completely. And then they can do pelvic and abdominal surgeries with a spinal epidural, that is, you know, our Alzheimer patients rebound from that almost instantaneously with no drop or impairment. Whereas, <clears throat> if they were going in for deep anesthesia, we might run into trouble. It's also true that the anesthesiologists used to deny that this was real. So when the first reports came out, the anesthesiologists all said, the American Academy of Anesthesiology, no way, anesthesiology is perfectly safe. This never would cause a memory problem. And then 
after looking at it over time, they began to think, you know, uh-oh, maybe this does. And then they realized that there was a whole boatload of research dollars, your tax dollars, at work through the NIH to understand this problem. And now they write books about it every day. And it's really helped to develop new practices in the field of anesthesia. Practices where in the old days, you know, they were like, put them out, put them down, and put them deep. Now, uh, nowadays, the conversation is quite different. They, you know, they put electrodes on your head and so that they can measure how deep you are, and they bring you just deep enough that you're not going to feel any pain or remember the surgery, but not too deep. And this really is, is groundbreaking uh, and uh, saving billions and billions of brain cells and delays in recovery post-surgery. It's really amazing uh, what the medical system is able to do when we pull together. And so it doesn't matter if you're a urologist or an anesthesiologist, they too are thinking about brain health. We all are.